Now, I think the uh, the next part is going to be a lot more interesting, and it's not going to be you know as basic. So we're going to be able to move on quickly. Okay, so we're going to talk about exploratory data analysis. <coughs> so in short, it's called EDA. So what is the EDA? So it's the the basics of EDA is to try to use um, mainly, I would say, graphical ways to look at data. Okay, and some of these ways are box plots, histograms, scatter plots. But they're also um, <coughs> ways, all, try to find better ways to look at data using transformations or QQ plot and so forth. Uh, we'll see some applications to microarray and flow cytometry data. Okay, so. A lot of people always think about statistics, you know, you're okay, statistics, you're going to do a test, you're going to have a p-value, and, uh, and that's it. You know, the p-value is less than a 0.05, you're done, you know, the, you've got significant results, it's great. But before you do that, you need to make sure the model is correct, you need to make sure you're looking at, at the right test. Uh, uh, there's a lot of assumptions you need to check and so forth, and the way to do that is to look at exploratory data analysis. So in my opinion, exploratory data analysis is probably one of the most important uh, aspects of statistics. So this was named by John Tukey, who was a very famous statistician. So as I said, the, uh, the techniques are mostly graphical, so it's plotting the raw data, histograms, scatter plots, etc. Uh, but they can also be looking at simple summary statistics like the mean, the median, computing the standard deviation, uh, doing the box plots but also trying to position the plot so as to maximize your natural pattern recognition abilities, really to try to visualize the data in the best way. And this is uh, in particular, uh, when we look at principal component analysis, this is trying to do exactly that. And I think, I mean, you know that, but a clear picture is worth a thousand words. So it's very important that you know how to display uh, um, your data in, in the best way possible. So here are a few tips, and in fact, I mean, this is something I always tell my student when I teach these uh, kinds of courses. <clears throat> and believe me, you can see all all kinds of crazy plots. You know, they somehow they try to make it very fancy. You know, lots of colors, lots of symbols and things, but at the end, you can't see anything on it. So it's very easy to generate plots that are useless where you can't see anything. Um, so don't. Try not to show too much information on the same graph. You know, avoid using too many colors, too many patterns, too many symbols, and so forth. Uh, I think it's clear that you should try to stay away from Excel. I mean, it's not a statistics package, and it's not a graphical package either. You know, I mean, with Excel, you can make very ugly plots. That's for sure. Um, in fact, I get very annoyed when I go to talks and I see the, these people showing all these plots and you can tell right away it's made by Excel because there's the gray background and there's the big bars and uh, it looks so ugly I don't understand why people would use Excel to make uh, graphics I mean in, in, in uh, looking at data analysis if you want to make any pictures with Excel you know go for it I don't care but uh, when you're looking at data analysis you should try to avoid it okay here are a few examples of bad plots uh, most likely in Excel of course <coughs> So why is this one bad? Well, the quality is bad, of course, but this is because I, I copied the plot for someone else. Yeah, so Excel is very good at making 3D plots that don't need 3D. Have you ever looked at that? When you do a histogram, whatever, the default is going to be like a fancy 3D, but it's just a 2D plot. So here, there's no reason to have that dimension, OK? It's only a histogram plot, it should be 2D. <clears throat> well, same again, here you've got uh, some fancy 3D thing that you don't really need. Well, here you do, have, you do have a third dimension if you want, but you just have four different uh, categories. So what you could do is just a simple uh, 2D plot with four different lines, colors, which will be a lot easier to compare the different lines. Same here. And by the way, all of these plots have been published in uh, journals and things. Here again, that's another example. Uh, you can't see anything. I mean, here, if you can see the difference between the four different uh, lines, I think you're very good. 
So it would be much easier to just put it in 2D, different uh, line types or colors or something else to distinguish the four uh, lines. What about this one? So this is um, a typical plot that you see in, you know, and I know many of you do uh, biology or biologists, but this is a typical plot you see in biological journals. Um, so putting a big bar and kind of like a small arrow bar over here. So the first thing is that <clears throat> we don't know that the errors are symmetric. So if you just show me half of it, how do I know it's the same thing on the other? side of the bar. Then you don't actually really need the bar. All you need is just a single number, right? This is, you're just looking at the height. So maybe the bar, you like it, and you know, it shows you the, the height. It's easier to compare, whatever, but you don't actually need the bars. But here, what's even more striking is that there are only three data points. So it duplicate samples. So they should have never com uh, computed uh, these uh, standard errors with the bar because, in fact, what you could have showed are the three numbers for each of these uh, data, right? You have only three numbers, it would be a lot better to show the three numbers here. So this was definitely not a good way to summarize your data. And if you want more plots, so these um, plots are actually compiled by uh, Carl Brumman, so he's a, a, a very nice uh, biostatistician at uh, the, uh, um, the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's done a lot of work on QTL and things like that. And he teaches a lot of courses like that. And there's a top 10 of the worst graphs that have been published in papers. So you can actually go back to the original paper and to see what it was about uh, and uh, where, where it was published. And uh, uh, so I really encourage you to do that. And it, it's quite interesting. Maybe that will uh, help you in not doing these kinds of graphs in the future. Okay, so this is, was just to summarize that export data, exploratory data analysis and graphical representation are very important. You should be very careful when you consider graphing something uh, because a graph will really show uh, your data directly and if you've got a bad graph, no one's going to understand what's going on in your data. Okay, so let's get to the basics of uh, probability and statistics. So we deal with probability statistics. So of course, we're gonna talk about probability distribution. <clears throat> so you probably already know, or you've heard before, or maybe you know you took a course 20 years ago, or whatever, that probability distributions can be either discrete or continuous. Okay. Some examples of, of, of probability distribution are uniform, Bernoulli, normal, etc. So typically, it's defined by a density function. Um, when it's discrete, you will typically use a p for probability mass function, or when it's continuous, you will use an f. I tend to say it's, it's all the same thing, so often I would just say density function, you know, whether it's discrete or continuous, and use an F. So here's an example of a discrete probability distribution. It's called the Bernoulli distribution. Uh, this will occur if you flip a coin. You can have a tail that's a zero or a head one, and uh, let's say the probability of head is 0.1. Then this will be your probability mass function. Uh, the probability of having a head or one is just 0.1. It's just a mass with 0.1. And here it will be 0.9, 1 minus 0.1, right? Because the sum of the probabilities need to add up to 1. So we can do that example in R. So R is great because you can generate random numbers. There are all the probability distributions you can work with. <coughs> So this will generate some values. We'll compute the density of the Bernoulli distribution at zero one, and then we can plot that. Here we go. So we've got the bar of 0.1 at one and 0.9 at zero. So the probability of having a one or a head is 0.1, and the probability of having a tail is 0.9. You can generate samples from a Bernoulli with a probability of success equal to 0.1. So let's try to do that in R. So here I should explain that first, there's no such things as random numbers. At least when you generate the numbers on a computer, it's never random, right? Because how do you 
how can it be random, right? The, the computer needs to use something to generate numbers. So there's nothing less random than a random number. By that I mean that in fact the numbers are not random at all, it's just a, a, it is a deterministic sequence that the computer uses, but they look very random. So if you look at them, you would have no idea that they're not random. So basically this is the, it's very complex, it's very hard to understand, but um, random numbers are not real numbers, so uh, random numbers are not really random, and you can actually fix the way that the machine will generate the numbers. And the way I do that, is by what we call setting the seed. So a random number generator will start with the seed, you give them the seed, and then you will generate the sequence of random numbers, and they will pass any test. They will look very random. So as far as you're concerned, they will be just like a sequence of real random numbers. But the computer uses a, a sequence to generate them. And in order that, uh, in order to have the same results everywhere, here, so that we can compare what we get, we're going to fix that seed so that we're going to make sure that all of our random numbers are the same. So here we fixed seed and we're going to generate 100 uh, uh, binomial random numbers. So it's like flipping, flipping a coin 100 times where the probability of having a uh, thing was head uh, is 0.1. Yeah, I don't get it either. But. No, the the so the way the the computer generates numbers or random numbers, it's actually sequence. So he will generate the first number, and then based on that, he will generate the second, and then the third, and so forth. So it's really just sequence. But the way it, the computer does it, it's just using an algorithm that's very clever. Is that when you look at them, they look very random. I mean, you would have no idea that it was actually a sequence that generated these numbers. What you need, you need a starting point. Where do you start? This is, you need to specify what we call a seed. So a seed will be the first, uh, will help you to generate the first number and then you can go along in your sequence. So if we all start at the same place, we have the same sequence, so of course we're going to generate the same numbers. Okay, if you use a different starting point, you will gener generate a new sequence of random numbers. But we, if we all start at the same place, if we all set the same seed, we will all get the same sequence of random numbers. Okay, so if I, if, you, if I do in a different computer set seed 100 and then it will generate the same... Exactly. exactly. It's because it's, it's using the exact same algorithm. So here what we did, we generated 100 numbers, uh, random numbers using the, the uh, Bernoulli distribution, and then we do a histogram of that. This is what it looks like. And of course, because it's more likely to have a zero than it is to have a one, and in fact, the probability is 0.1, so we should, we should get roughly 10 out of the 100 should be one, and 90 out of the 100 should be zero. Yeah, this is roughly what we get. So why because there's 100 so the sum of these two things so here you've got maybe about 15 and here you've got or 10 and here you've got 90 so the sum is, is about 100 right so it's like tossing a, a coin 100 times and Oh, because by default, the plot, the, uh, the plotting function will actually take the maximum number and set that as a limit for y. Because here, the maximum is not 100, is less, is about 90, so it stops at 90. But you could specify that, you know, if, you're, if you don't like that, you can say uh, y lim, so you can specify the limits that you want, and you say I want to go from 0 to 100. Okay, so you can change that. But the default is just to look at the range of your data and to say the x-axis will be the range and the y-axis will be the range of your data. Because the, there's no point in, in looking outside of the range because there's nothing anyway. That's the main idea. But sometimes you want to change that and you can customize it. So you generated these 100 uh, observations like cos uh, tossing your coin 100 times and you count how many zeros and ones you have. You do a histogram or you tell you these zeros and ones and the histogram that you get is kind of like 
an estimation of the density or the probability distribution. Okay, so now we're going to look at a, a continuous distribution. And once again, please stop me anytime. If you think I'm going too fast, if you've got questions, please ask me. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we can uh, generate from a continuous distribution. Probably the most famous continuous distribution is the Gaussian distribution or the normal distribution, or maybe you know it at the, as the uh, bell curve because it looks like a bell curve. Okay, it looks like this. So here it's a, uh, what did I use? So this is a normal distribution with mean zero. So it is centered at zero. It has standard deviation one, which means that roughly most of the observation are between uh, minus two and two. So you can actually do that uh, using R. We're gonna look at the range from, so by the way, this is another way to create a vector. So maybe I should point that out to you. We've seen the C to concatenate numbers. We've seen the rep to do just replicate a number n times. We've seen the 1 to 4, 1 to 12, you know, the one with the column and the other number. You generate a sequence uh, going from 1 to 12. We've seen that. This is th the same idea. But this is if you want to have a sequence that's not necessarily a sequence of integer going from one to another. So this says go from minus four to four and with a step size of 0.1. So let's look at what this looked like. Okay, so it goes from minus four to four every 0.1. <clears throat> Once again, there's many ways to create objects in R and often it will depend on the context which one you want to use because some will be easier than others. So here this is really what I wanted. This is the most direct way to create that uh, vector. Because I could of course do it by hand, you know, C of minus 4, minus 3.9 and so forth, but it would take me a long time and it's useless because there's a function to do it directly. Okay, so I've told you uh, even though we've looked at the R basics, you're still going to learn a lot of commands and functions as we go along because it's just impossible for me to enumerate all the things you could do with R. <laughs> so this is the X, and then I'm going to compute the I'm going to evaluate the normal density at each values of X when that uh, normal density has mean zero and standard deviation one. Okay, and this is what it looks like. This is the nice bell curve that you know. It has mean zero and sound deviation one. <coughs> so the difference with a continuous and a discrete distribution is that for a, a discrete distribution, you look at any value, zero or one, and it tells you the probability that it's zero and it's one when you look at the value of, of the function. So here, let me maybe just step back to this one. Oops. So here this is the probability mass function for the discrete distribution. The probability that zero is the value of that point. The probability of one is the value of that point. For a continuous distribution, it's different because since it is continuous, you cannot really take exactly on one single value. So typically, we would look at the probability that the random variable is within a given interval. And here, to compute that probability, you will look at the area under the curve. So using a Gaussian distribution, you will know that the probability that your variable is between 0 and 2 is the area below that curve. And R can compute that for you really easily. There's some functions that you can use to do that. Is this kind of clear? Now we're getting into statistics and everyone's going to get lost. Oh, yeah. So here I plot x versus f. Okay, fairly standard. I want the x label to be x. I want the y label to be density. So x is here, density is here. I want the width of the line to be 5. So the larger the number, the larger the width of the line. And then I want the type to be a line because you can have points, you can have both. So let's play with that. That's a, that's a good thing. 
So for example, we could have P, which will mean points. Okay. So what it will do is that it won't draw a line, instead it will draw each point. Okay. No line in between. You can have both, which mean point and line, and it would put the point and the line. And you can play with the width. You can do it lighter. Okay. 10 becomes very big and so forth. Okay? Oh, this is uh, B for both. Okay? So this is what I mean that when I say that R is really good software to make high quality plots. You can customize it exactly how you want. You can move things everywhere. You can have all symbols, colors. You can make great uh, PDF or JPEG or whatever graphics and then you can just copy and paste into Word. You can really make high quality graphics. Okay. So same again here we can uh, generate a sample from a normal distribution. So here I generate 100 observations from a normal 0, 1. And this time I don't use D norm, I use R norm. So D is for density, which is what I used before to compute the density at a given value. But this time I use R norm, which is for random generation. So R norm, 100 numbers mean 0, standard deviation 1. And then I plot a histogram. Okay? The key point here is that when you've got some data looking, doing a histogram of your data, it gives you an idea of the distribution because a histogram can be used to estimate the densities, right? So it's kind of like an estimate of the density. You can see here that it looks a lot like a bell curve, right? And of course, the more data point I'm going to get, the better the, the estimate is going to become. Actually, we can play with that a little bit. So here we generate 100 um, <coughs> excuse me, 100 uh, random numbers from a normal distribution would mean zero in standard deviation one. We do a histogram. Okay. Let's say we're going to do the same thing, but with a thousand data points. Okay. You can see it's becoming better and better. If you do it with 10,000 data points. you're becoming a better and better bell curve. Just because the more point you have, the better the estimate of the density. Okay, so this is pretty basic stuff because I wanted to talk a little bit about probability distribution. Yes? In the, in the previous function, did not uh, compute the probability that a vector that you input follows that is the normal distribution? No, 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 no. You're just, you, you assume it's, it's, it's normal, you want to compute the density at that point or the probability mass function at that point, so you use denom to do that. Here's just, I mean, it's a toy example, it's not that interesting. We're going to look at real data sets and what we can do there. So it's not really something you would do in reality when you get data, do denom. You would never do that. It's just to show you that if we do have a couple of toy examples, we know the true density, we do the histogram, they look alike. That's the main point of this exercise. Okay? Any other questions? Is it a build function if you want to build the pairs? Say that again? If you want to build that, is it a build bar, build bar, or hash bar? Yeah, 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 you can do that. Um, I do have some of these things later on. I can't remember how to do it, but you can do it. We'll, we'll, we'll get to such an example. But yeah, you can do, I mean, you, everything you can think of, you can do it. You need, it's just a matter of, of uh, inputting the right comment. Okay, so, <clears throat> so we've seen the probability distribution. The key point here is that the histogram is a good way to estimate the density of, of, a, func of, of, um, of a random variable. So it's a good way to sort of estimate the distribution of a random variable. So if you're if you're using a t-test, for example, and you want to know all of our data 
normally distributed because that's one of the assumptions of, of the t-test. Then do histogram, you know, is it, does it look like a bell curve? Yes, then it's, it's probably okay. If it looks very different, then you should say, well, there's a problem here, I need to do something. But we'll get to that. Yeah, so there are things we can do. Okay. Yeah. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that anyway. Okay, so one thing we can do is looking at what we call quantiles and QQ plots. Okay, so what is a quantile? So this is the definition. So the P quantile is the value with the property that there's a probability P of getting a value less than or equal to it. And at this point, you're like, well, this is great. So let's look at an example that you can understand better. So we're going to do that in R again. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to graph that. So this is the normal distribution, okay? And this is the 90th or the 90 percentile or the 90th quantile. So what this means is that below this value, there's 90% of the area under the whole curve is below that value, okay? So there's 90% of probability that you will get something below that value, okay? So that is the quantile. So a quantile is the a point, it's the value at which below that value, the probability of getting it is the quantile. So for example, the 50% quantile is called the median. And in this case, let's look at the plot. What do you think the 50% uh, uh, quantile is? It's zero, right? Because it divides the curve symmetric, so it divides it in two halves, and therefore, it's 50-50, and that is the chance of getting something below zero is 50%, okay, because it is symmetric, okay? In fact, when you get, when you have a symmetric density, okay. symmetric distribution, the median is always zero, and therefore, uh, the 50% quantile will always be zero. Of course, here we don't, I mean, it's quite difficult to compute a quantile otherwise, and there's a function in R that can do that for you, if you tell him this is normal distribution, so I use Q norm, and the my normal distribution has mean zero, sine division one, and I want the 90% quantile, and therefore it will get that to you. And this is what I do here. I get that number, I plot F, and then I do a straight line at uh, a vertical line at Q90. Okay, so this is what this is doing. Okay, so <clears throat> this is really nice, and this is what I said when uh, these, these are just a toy example, is that in practice, you have no idea what the distribution is, right? So how can you compute a quantile? Well, what we can do is that we cannot compute maybe the exact quantile based on the true distribution, but we can just compute what we call an empirical quantile. That is based on the data that I have observed, what do you think the quantile is? So it's fairly easy to do. So in this case, the definition of the empirical quantile is the P quantile will be the value with the property that P percent of the observation are less than or equal to it, okay? So how do you do? You're going to order your data set or your data points, and then you're just going to count 80. So let's say there's 100 data points in your data set, and you want the 80 percent quantile. You're going to count 80. You take the 80 number, you know that below that you've got 80% of the data points because there's 100, okay? So it's fairly easy to do that um, uh, numerically. You just order your value and you're going to take the value that gives you 80% of the value be below that. Good question. How do we order or sort a vector in R? Yes. Okay. So that's very difficult. Um, it's probably, it is something like sort. So we're going to do question mark sort. And fair enough, you can sort a vector. 
Okay, so there's probably an example at the end. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here they use data set. Uh, they use data set which is part of stats. It's a package, so we can just do that. And here's some data, and you can just sort that. Okay, and you can see that it's sorting the data for you. Okay, so it's very easy, you can do that. But in fact, uh, you don't even have to do it uh, because there's even a quantile function which will do the sorting and the counting of the numbers for you automatically. <coughs> so here's an example. Again, we're going to generate something from a normal distribution. Okay, and we're going to do quantile of x. Okay, so by default, the quantile of, of x will actually give you what we call the quartile. That is, the 0% uh, quantile, the 25th person quantile, the 50% quantile, 75th person quantile, 100% quantile. Okay, so this is the default of the function. Remember that functions in R have uh, sensible defaults. That is, if you don't specify the other arguments, you will just come up with an answer for you. However, I, maybe I don't care about these quantiles. What I want is the 10%, the 20%, and 90%. So I can just specify that. I just specify the probabilities via the quantile function, and you will do that for me. Okay? Yes? Yes, so a summary is a function that will give you a summary of any objects in R, and one of the summary for a vector will just be very similar to the quantile. Actually, the summary, we can do that right away, we'll talk about summary, but if you do summary of an object, which is x here, it will return the median, the first quartile, which is the 25th percentile, the third quartile, which is the, 50, uh, the 75th, and the max, which is 100, and the mean, which is that. So summary is like a fancy uh, quantile function. In addition, it also gives you the mean. That's the main difference. But we'll talk about summary. <clears throat> is that sort of clear what the quantiles are and what it's doing? Is that OK? So we'll get back to quantiles with the QQ plot. So um, often in statistics, gonna, you're going to be given a data set, and you want to very quickly uh, quantify the data set and maybe summarize it you know, with some summary statistics, like the mean, the median. There are other things you can compute, like the variance, the standard deviation. Okay? And all of these things are available in R. Remember, R is also a statistical language. So there are a lot of statistical functions that are built in, like the mean, the median, uh, the finance and so forth. So let's go and try to look at that. So let's look first at, let's look at that. So we've got x, we can compute the mean of x. Okay, and remember because it's a normal distribution that, that we use to generate the numbers, we mean zero, then the empirical mean should be pretty close to the true mean, which is zero, which it is here. The median should be also pretty close to zero because it is a symmetric distribution. You can compute what's called uh, the interquartile range or the IQR. We'll talk about that. So the IQR is just a measure of the variability in the data. It's very similar to a standard deviation, if you want. The variance. Say that again. A standard deviation. Okay, <clears throat> so these these are the mean and the median are what we call measures of location. They sort of tell you where is the peak of your distribution or most of your distribution. The IQR, the variance, and the standard deviation are just measures of the variability in your data. Okay, and when you want something very quickly, you want to know roughly what the mean is, the median, and so forth. You get the summary of x, and that will tell you what the summary is. And the good thing about summary, remember earlier I was talking about 
or being uh, um, object-oriented uh, language, meaning that some functions will know what to do depending on what the argument is, then the summary function is like that. That is, if x is a vector, it will give you the summary for that vector. If it is a matrix, it will give you a summary for each row and so forth. So it will know what to do depending on the type of the argument. <coughs> Okay, so this is what I mean here. Summary can be used for almost any R object, and R is object oriented. <coughs> so, what, what if you do a summary of a, a dot table? Does it summarize all the columns and all the, the, the. I would think that if it's a data frame, probably it will summarize every variable in your data frame. I can't remember exactly, mm -hmm. uh, but it's my guess. Each column? Each column, yeah which makes sense because you wanted to summarize each variable, right? Um, okay, so what is the box plot? Oh, the, by default, R assumes that the variable is in a column. No, it's because it's a data frame, so you will know that columns are variable. They are the one that will have the names. But what if it's the opposite? Do I have a way to tell R that my actual the variables are in, in the... Yeah, you would... Well, if the variables are the rows, then you should put in a data frame where your variables are the columns. Oh, okay. Because I cannot deal with you, you can. There are ways to, to do that. OK, so um, let's look at the box plot. Because we've seen how these things are very um, easy. But they just give you just one number. And it's nice to have a graphical representation that might summarize all of these numbers. And one way to do that is using the box plot. So here, I still generate the same random numbers from the normal distribution. And then I use the box plot function. So what is the box plot? The box plot is just a graphical representation of some summary statistics. The first one that you see, which is the thick line at the middle, is the median. <coughs> this is the 25th quantile, 75th quantile. This is what we call the IQR, the inter-quartile uh, range. Then there's what we call uh, the whiskers, here and here. And these are calculated using uh, 1.5 times the IQR. And typically, everything that's outside of the whiskers are considered outliers. So it's a nice way to summarize your data, because it will show you the location of the data by the median, the variability. You know, if you've got a box that's very long, it will mean that the data are highly variable. If the box is very uh, small, it will tell you that there, there's not much variability. If the whiskers are very long, it will tell you there might be a lot of outliers, and the outliers will typically be shown with symbols outside of that. So here there are no outliers. These are called the, the whiskers, the, the things that I extended from uh, the box. No. They are calculated using 1 point, so you, you start from here, you do 1.5 times the IQR, you stretch that, you draw a line, you do the same thing below, okay? And you, you, you don't want to use the mean and the max because the goal of this exercise is to see if there are potential outliers, things that are very far away from the median, even taking into consideration the variability of the data. What's the percentage of data that's in between the, the 90% You don't know. It depends on the data. Okay. However, what's the percentage that, in, uh, that is in the box? Sorry? What's the percentage that's in the box here? It be 50%. Right? 50%, right? Yeah. But uh, corresponding to the whiskers, we don't know. For example, here it's 100% because there's no outliers. There's nothing that's too far away from, from, the, from uh, the median. But typically, it will, be, it will be high enough because the, the goal of the, of the box plot is to see if there are any potential outliers, one of the goals, right? And so typically, there will be only a few outliers. So I would say usually it will be close to 95%. But there are some boxes in which there is another, uh, another level, which is 1.9 uh, IQ, IQRs. Yeah, there might be actually. And those are the far outliers, the ones that will. Uh, there might be an option in box plots to change up. But the real definition of the box plot is 1.5. <coughs> okay.
Yeah, see here, I think you can change that. Okay. Okay, so now we're getting right to the point. So many statistical methods make some assumptions about the distribution of the data. E.g., you know, they're normal. So the quantile quantile plot provides a really nice way to visually verify such assumptions. So the idea of the QQ plot is you're going to assume a distribution. You're going to say, well, I want my data to be normal, or I'm testing if they are normal. So therefore, you know the theoretical quantiles of the normal distribution, right? We can compute that in R. Then you can also compute the empirical quantiles, just like we've seen. And the idea is that you're going to compare the empirical quantile to the theoretical quantile. And if the distribution you assumed is correct, then they should pretty much line up. And we're going to see that on the example. Let's do uh, a very easy example. Uh, we're here, so we generate uh, 100 numbers from the normal distribution. We do the QQ plot for the normal distribution. It's called QQ norm. Okay. So QQ norm is like doing a QQ plot for a normal distribution. <clears throat> and here we can see the theoretical quantiles versus the sample quantiles or the empirical quantiles. It's just the same thing. QQ line will just add a line to the plot and it will add the line which uh, shows you where the, all the points should be if the distributions were exactly the same. Okay? So you can see here that the points line up pretty well on the line. Of course it's not perfect because we've generated some data points and therefore there is some variability. So you're not going to get something that's perfectly aligned. But looking at this, I would say, well, it's pretty good. It's well around the line. You know, I, I have no reason to believe that it's not normal. Okay? Again, it's a bit subjective in a way because, you know, it's a graphical representation. But things that you want to do when you, when you do these sorts of analysis and exploratory data analysis. You can measure that, right? Yeah, you can. So there are statistics you can compute and things, but I don't, I mean, typically I don't really trust them. It's, it's much easier to do something and, and, and do it visually here. The key point is that what we want to make sure is that there are no big violation, violation of assumptions. You know, some of these tests are, some of these tests can be fairly robust to slight departure from the assumption. Like uh, linear regression, which you're going to see tomorrow, is okay if, if it's not perfectly uh, normal or, uh, or uh, constant variance or whatever. So what you want to test is that the assumptions are <coughs> fairly correct, that you know, there's no big violation of the assumption. And this is why doing it graphically is probably enough. We're going to see that. <coughs> so here's an example. Here we're using another distribution. It's called the t-distribution. How many of you have heard of the t-distribution before? Raise your hand. I can't see them. Two? OK. Three, four? Uh, have you heard of the t-distribution before? Just before when I asked the question first. <laughs> Okay, um, so the t-distribution is very, actually, it's very similar to the normal. It's a bell curve, but it has heavier tail than the normal distribution. Okay, heavier tails than the normal distribution. So um, do I have a plot that shows the converse? So this is, I've generated 100 data points from a t-distribution, and I'm going to do a histogram of that. <coughs> Should let me do something like that. So in the histograms, you can also uh, specify the number of beans that you want. Okay, so here I, w I wanted to have more beans, so I said 100. What you can see is that 
that T distribution has two degrees of freedom, and the smaller the degrees of freedom, the more uh, the heavier the tails will be. Okay, so it's a distribution that's fairly um, close to the Gaussian distribution. There's uh, um, an extra parameter which is called the degrees of freedom. When the degrees of freedom is very small, it's going to have a uh, much heavier tail than the normal distribution. When the degrees of freedom is large, it's going to be very close to the normal distribution. So here I used two just because I wanted it to be slightly different from the normal distribution, just to show you an example. So the T distribution is kind of handy when um, you've got lots of outliers in your data, for example. Anyway, uh, this is just a, a key point to show you the difference. <coughs> so if you look at this um, histogram here, you can see that you've got a few outliers here, very large values that are far away from the mean. This is something you would never get with the normal distribution. So let's just look at a QQ plot of this. Okay, so here it's pretty extreme. You can see that even though most of the points are fairly lined up, some of them are very far away from the line. So if you see something like that, you know there's something wrong. You know, there's a lot of outliers. Uh, the, the tails are a lot heavier than what they should be for a normal distribution. Again, these are toy examples. We're going to move on to some real data sets afterwards. So here we've been comparing uh, normal distributions. Well, we've done a QQ norm, which is a QQ plot, when you want to compare it to a normal distribution. Sometimes you don't know what the distribution is, or you want to test other possible distributions. So here we're going to do the same uh, thing, but we're going to use the QQ plot common, where you can compare two samples. So here I generate one sample from the normal distribution, another one from the normal, and I do a QQ plot of these two. Guess what? Because it's normal and normal, they should line up again. Okay, so you can see that they line up fairly well. If we do the same thing with the T and the normal using the QQ plot. Again, you see the same behavior. There's one of them that's uh, very far away from the line. And again here, you could just use QQ, um, QQ norm because we're testing for the normal. But I wanted to show you that if you've got just two samples, you want to see if they are from the same distribution. Assuming that you don't know anything about the actual true distribution, then you can use that. So here, introducing the theoretical. Exactly. Because you don't know the theoretical. So what you can do. Either you, either you have two samples that you want to compare to see if they have the same distribution, or you wanted to, uh, you have one sample and you want to use another distribution that's not built in into R. What you can do is that you can just generate from any distribution you want, and you can compare the empirical of these two. But I wanted to bring that up. Um, well, actually, I had that. See, I didn't even know. So I had that plot where we compare. Uh, the T and the normal. So you can see here, this is the normal distribution in black, and in red is the T distribution. So in shape, they look very similar, but the main difference is it, are the tails. Here you can see that uh, the probability of having something far away from the mean is uh, greater, same on this side. But in fact, if you just look at these two plots, you will say, oh, these, di you know, these two distributions are not very different. But then when you look at the Kiki plot above, you say, well, this is very different. In fact, there's you know, a lot of outliers over here, things that are far away from the mean that I would not get with the normal distribution. So if your data were to look like that, you'll be in trouble when you do linear regression, for example, or when you do a t-test, maybe. You, know, you would have to be a bit careful. What, what happens if one of the data is in a range of values, let's say, from minus 20 to 15, and the mean I mean, this is like a normal distribution, but it's shift. Well, we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll see on, on real uh, examples. <coughs> okay, so we've seen that you can also compare two samples. The idea is that you know they should be they should line up if they are similar, or you will see something that's not really a straight line if if the two samples are different. 
So this is kind of interesting because this is the main idea behind quantile normalization. I don't know if some of you have heard of quantile normalization for microarrays. This is the idea. You've got two microarray samples. They're coming from the same experiment, you know, the, the ex exactly the same experimental conditions. You would expect the two distributions to be fairly similar, right? But in reality, there are some technical variation that makes them different. So you want to correct for that. One way you can do that is that, let's say you have two microarrays that are very similar. Um, and they should, in theory, they should sort of line up like this, but they don't. What you can do is that you can force them to line up. So you will sort of do a plot like that. You will see a departure from assumption because it won't be exactly a straight line. But then you can do transformation to make it line up. And this is what the quantile normalization does. It will try to match the quantile between the two samples to make them the, the most similar possible. And this is uh, the way to sort of reduce the technical variation that you have in your data. Um, what time is the break, Francis? Oh, okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> another way to look at data are scatter plots. So as we know, you know, when you do statistics and you're supposed to use bioinformatics, uh, your data are typically multivariate, right? I mean, it's rare to have just one measurement per patient, for example, right? You might measure the blood, the pressure, the height, the weight. It is multivariate. So scatter plots are a good way to look at two variables at a time. So here's an example. This is the, the graph versus host disease flows automatic data set. Um, <clears throat> so graph versus host disease, it is actually a disease that you get after a bone marrow transportation uh, where the um, um, I can't remember if it's the, the, uh, the immune system of uh, donor. the donor that attacks your, uh, uh, the host. So here what we, what we have are, it's a flow cytometric ex uh, experiment, so we have several uh, um, cell surface markers and we're going to measure different uh, uh, cell surface proteins. So it is multivariate for, uh, but we've got millions, of, uh, not millions, but we've got thousands of cells, we've got different markers for each cell, and therefore it is definitely multivariate. So what we can do, we can do a scatter plot of one of the markers, which is here, CD4, against the other markers, which, which is a CD8 beta. <clears throat> a scatter plot like that can actually be used to test or to verify independence. So here, when you look at a plot like that, do you think the two variables are independent. Of course, you don't know very much about the experiment and everything, but do you, just looking at that, do you see some kind of independence between the two? No, if it, if it was um, independent, you will see some kind of a big round cloud where one variable doesn't tell you anything about the other variable. But what happens in full cytometry is that you've got um, um, You've got a sample that you run into uh, the machine, and then you're going to measure each cell for various markers. What happens is that you get a mixture of cell uh, populations. So what you're going to see here is that often here you might get maybe kind of like a cluster of points, which might be one cell subpopulation. Here you might have another one. Here you might have another one, and here and here. So here there's actually about five to six cell subpopulations. Um, so from that, it's clear that if you know that uh, the value of CD4 is around here, then you're either in here, in this population, or this one, or that one, okay? If you're, the value of CD4 is about 100, then you're either in that population or in that population, but it's very unlikely that you're around 200. So you can see that it's not independent because if you know something about one of the variable, it will tell you something about the other variable. So scatter plots versus correlation. So we know that we've got two variables, one which you measure independence or correlation, two things that are completely, uh, that are not exactly the same, is to compute the correlation between the two variables. So in fact, in the example that I showed you before, the correlation is 0.23. So this is pretty low, right? We know that the correlation is typically between minus one and one when it's close to one. 
it means that probably there's a high correlation between the two variable and they're definitely not independent. Well, if we look at that example, we get only uh, 0.23, which is not very big, but you have to remember the correlation, the correlation coefficient is only good for linear dependence. And in our case, in the flow cytometry example, we definitely uh, don't have uh, a linear dependence between the two. So why don't we go and try to do that in R? Yes. Uh, are you just talking about general uh, normalization in general, or? I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to compare it to a different statistical program where you can relativize your data and get rid of the variables so you can compare, um, say, I guess, like this water quality versus fish, and you can put them all together and be able to have them and plot them against each other because you can relativize it, um, which can sometimes it's include normal, or centering it, normalizing it. Yeah, well, you can, you can, No, you can I mean, there's tons of, of graphical displays and things in R. Um, and not with your actual numbers, and you actually change the numbers so that they all fall in the same. I'm not sure I, I know what you mean. Uh, okay. It's probably, yeah, it's probably highly dependent on your data and the problem. So there's probably a lot of things you could do. Um, and I don't know about what language or software you're talking about. Okay. But for sure, you know, I mean, if it, if it is like a statistical software, for sure you can do it in R. No question. Um, okay, so let's try to load the data. Remember, well, you probably didn't close R, so you're probably in the right directory anyway. <clears throat> so here I read the table. Here what I do is that I'm going to subset the variable. Uh, okay, let's first do a summary of GBHD. Okay, so right away you can see that it's doing the summary per variable. We've got the four scattered, the side scattered, which are measuring um, the, the, uh, basically the, the shape and the size of the cells, uh, which are just uh, reflection of lights on the cells. And then you've got uh, the surface markers CD4, CD8, CD3, CD, uh, CD8 beta, and CD8. <coughs> so right away you get a quick summary of this data. Then here I only care about the one that are greater than 280, and that's because we know about that threshold. It was it's coming from a negative uh, sample where there's no GVHD, and therefore we're only interested in the cells that have uh, the fifth variable, which will be CD3 greater than 280. Okay, so this is coming from uh, the biology that we know we only want to look at these cells, and then that is I'm only subsetting the cells that have the CD3 uh, uh, greater than 280 or CD3 positive and then I'm only going to look at the fluorescence markers and I'm, I'm going to forget about four scattered and side scattered so I only select three to six as columns and I create a data frame from that because a subset I want to make sure it's a data frame so I use as that data frame exactly Typically should be, but just to be cautious, you know, I prefer to do that. Um, but um, I don't think you would really need to do it. You could do that based on the names, but uh, it's easier here to. Uh, it's much quicker to write three to six, right, you know, versus writing all the names. So. Yeah, but it, yeah, but here since they are continuous variable from three to six, it's just you know, it, you 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 should use whatever is easier depending on the context, right? Yeah. You you so the 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 goal of R or any language is to try to write minimal code that will do what you want to do. So we've selected that, and then I'm only going to look 
so I created a new data frame that I call GVHZ CD3 positive. I'm only going to look at the first and second variables. Exactly, which is basically looking at CD4 and CD8. So the four figures and markers, only the first two. Okay, and here once again, you can actually see, um, in here there's actually one, two, about one, two, three, maybe four, five, and perhaps six uh, cell subpopulations. And if you compute the correlation between the two variables, you will see that it's fairly low. So this means that <coughs> a scatter plot will typically tell you more about uh, independence of two variables than correlation. Remember that the coefficient of correlation only uh, tells you about linear independence. That is, if the correlation is zero, it does not necessarily mean that two variables are independent. It just means that they are not linearly dependent. Here's an example. Okay. Here I generated some variables that way. I've got x and y. This is what I, so this is really a toy example. What do you think the correlation is between these two, between x and y? One. One, okay. Zero. Zero. Try to guess. So what, what say a number between minus one and one. It's one, okay. Zero, okay, we got two ones versus two zeros. <laughs> no one else? How can you tell? Well, <clears throat> the thing is that it's completely symmetric around zero. So it has to be zero. Uh, so let's go and look at that in R. However, so before we look at that, however, when you look at these two, you know that they are not independent because if you know that x is 0, then y is minus 1 or 1. So it's definitely not independent, but the correlation is 0. So you need to be very careful about correlation versus independence. And this way of measuring independence? No, because it's very difficult to measure independence. So it's just visual and analysis. Exactly. Typically, people would look at correlation. If you've got a high correlation, then you know it's not dependent. If you've got low correlation, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's independent. You should probably look at it more closely using um, a plot. But it's very difficult to measure dependence because it depends on the distribution that you have and so forth. So dependence, independence, it's a very tricky thing in statistics. But uh, Typically, using exploratory data analysis, you can get a feel of, of uh, whether things are dependent or not. So this was really a toy, uh, toy example. Okay, so I generate x and y and then plot that. Uh, oh, it's because I... You don't need to close R. <clears throat> what time is the break, Michelle? Oh, okay. So it means it was like 10 minutes ago. Yeah, and I'm getting tired, so I think I'm going to take a break. Okay, so let's take a break now. Okay, so we're going to start again, because uh, we're running a bit out of time. We still have many slides to go over. Before we start, is there any questions? Things you want me to go over again or you did not understand? 
No? Okay, so we're going to continue with exploratory data analysis. So another thing that you can do in R are uh, uh, truly graphics. So it's just a, a, a nice way when you've got multiple panels you want to look at. It's a nice way to look at multivariate data sets all at once. I'm not going to go into too many of the details, but there is one way you can do that directly in R is that if you've got a data frame okay, and you want to look at it, uh, typically, when you do a scatter plot, you need to specify the x and the y, right? Because you want to plot x versus y. Well, let's try to, <coughs> to do that directly in R. And you will see that what you will do is um, a panel of scatter plots. For each of the variables, it will show you this is the plot of looking at CD8 beta versus CD4. This is looking CD8 beta versus CD3. CD8... Um, CD4 versus CD3 and so forth. So it's kind of like a matrix that contains all of the plots. So <clears throat> let's try to look at that in R. Okay, so you should note that here I actually um, use another option in the plot. I use PCH, which will be the plotting symbol. So you could use different things. So for example, you could use a plus sign if you want. Okay. And now you get the idea why I did not use the plus sign to begin with. It's because there's so many data points that it takes a long time to actually draw all of these plots, all of these points on the plot. So when you got data set that got many data points in the data set, it's, very, it's a good idea to just use the dot because it will be lighter and it won't take very long to display that on the graphic. And also when you generate PDFs or G JPEG for uh, a paper or something, there will be much more like plots. So it's better to do that. It's a lot quicker. And you can see quickly you know, the distribution of the things in all of the possible scatter plots using all, uh, all of the uh, possible variables. Is that clear what we're seeing here? OK. <coughs> so these types of plots are very nice to look at because you can quickly look at all the data sets, all the possible combinations. And it's a nice way to look at um, the data very quickly to identify possible artifacts or possible things that might be interesting. And there are many more possibilities, but we don't have time to go over that today. But there's a very nice package that's called the Lattice Package that allows you to generate tons of graphs like that, conditioning on variables and, and factors and so forth. Uh, we don't have time to look at it, but I really encourage you to look at it. It's very, very interesting what you can do with it. It's very powerful. Okay, so let's look at <coughs> the uh, the GVHD data. And now, from now on, we're only going to look at the CD3 positive sample because we know a little bit more about that. So the first thing we'd like to do is maybe a box plot, just to have an idea of what the the, uh, the variables look like. And the good thing, again, about the box plot is that if you input uh, a data frame, you will know how to deal with it. And what it will do is that it will do specific box plot for each of these variables. Okay? So here we've got the four uh, fluorescent markers, which are the four uh, surface protein markers. And then this is the distribution of the first, of the second, third, and fourth. Okay? So what can you say about this from what we've seen uh, up to now about box plots? Let's just look at um, let's look at that one for example. What can you say about this one? Yeah, it has a lot of outliers. Do you think it's symmetric? It's not really symmetric because here you can see the whisker is a lot longer. There's more outliers. Okay, so it's not exactly symmetric. It's fairly skewed. Then if you compare them across, you can see there's some variation in the overall uh, intensity shown by the median. There's some variation in the actual variability of, of um, the markers within uh, uh, of all the markers across the, the different panels. 
Uh, here there's some outliers on this side. However, from what we've seen before, um, so box plot is a nice way to look at it, but sometimes it's not the best way to look at some kinds of data. And we're going to see why. Can I ask you about the uh, whiskers there, the third box plot? You said the whiskers are 1.5 times the interquartile range. Right. And it doesn't look right, the third one. Is that um, like the bottom one, for example? Yeah, I do. So uh, typically this is how they are defined, but I don't really know how they're defined in R. So it could be that the default is different. It's defined by the, um, the point which is within the interquartile. Okay, so that's why then. So we, okay, so that's a good explanation. So if you've got. It defines the interquartile, the 1.5 times the interquartile range, and then it finds the. That's the last point that, the last that's within point the range. Within the range. Okay, that makes sense. Good. Uh, what we just said here or everything? <laughs> okay. So, so I said earlier that... Um, I know that part. Yeah, <laughs> which part? Okay, this is how I defined the, uh, the, the box plot earlier. I said that typically you would define the whiskers as 1.5 times the IQR. But if, um, so you can see that this one is slightly longer than the one below. And what happens is that the last data point uh, is, is shown with this. So it will stop at the last data point. Okay, if there are outliers, it will go up to 1.5 times IQR. But if there's no outlier, it will just draw that point to um, that line at the last data point. So it might be slightly shorter than 1.5 times the IQR. That makes sense? Okay. So another way to look at um, um, each variable and to have a sense of the distribution is to do a histogram, okay? So if we do a histogram of each of the variables, CD4, CD8, beta, CD3, CD8, what you can see is that um, the data are not really uh, symmetric, but they're not unimodal. You can see two modes here, for example, one over here, one over here. Here you've got one over here, one over here, same here, and this one is sort of uh, all squished towards the, uh, uh, the zero. So the density show you a very different picture than the box plots. And the main reason is because box plots are not very good to display things that are not unimodal. Because in the box plot that we had earlier, we summarize the location of the distribution with the median, okay? But it's not very good if you've got sort of two peaks, you would want to have the location of the first peak and the location of the second peak, if possible. So sometimes the box plot is not really the right way to look at the data if they are not unimodal. If you've got two peaks here, it would be better to summarize maybe this one and this one. And here it's because it's a very particular data set. We've got a mixture of cell populations. So potentially there is one population over here, one population over here. So what you would want is more of a summary for this one and a summary of this one. And a histogram is better in, in, in this sense to look at these kinds of data. <clears throat> so actually, I'm just, we're just going to move on for the sake of time to the, um, you can just try that on your own, copy and paste, and you will get the exact same figure here. So let's look at another data set. So this is a gene expression data set. Uh, we're comparing, uh, so this is a cell line. We're comparing cells that are infected with HIV virus versus cells that are not infected. Uh, this was a time course experiment. We're only going to look at the time point 24 hours uh, after infection. The good thing about this data set is that we've got 12 positive controls that are actually HIV uh, genes, so genes from the virus itself. So they, they should be extremely differentially expressed because they will be expressed when the cells are infected with the virus and they should be not expressed uh, for the cells that are not infected with the virus. 
we've got four replicates, two with a die swap. So uh, for those who don't really know too much about gene expression analysis, this was done with a two-color microarray, so you could uh, <coughs> put two samples on the same slide. You will color the two samples and then measure each gene using the color coming from the treatment, which is HIV infected and control non-infected. You get two color, red and green, and sometimes people will swap the colors, so they will do two green, uh, red and green, and then two green and red for the two samples. And this is typically a good way to see if there's any dye effect. So this is one of the samples here. Uh, this is actually an image that's coming from the macro. You can see all of the about 8,000 genes, and the reds are the positive controls. So here we'll assume that the image analysis has been processed. We've got the, uh, for each gene, we've got a spot with an intensity uh, for that gene in the corresponding sample. Therefore, we've got a data matrix of size uh, 7,000 times 8, 8 for the four replicate times uh, uh, either treatment or control. Okay, so that you have the data set. We can uh, read the data set in the same way as before. We can do a summary very quickly and we can do a box plot. And again, the box plot will be uh, done directly with uh, the whole data frame. Therefore, you will have a box plot for each of the array. In this case, we've got uh, actually four arrays, four replicates, four coming from the HIV, the treatment, four coming from the control. Okay, so this one is the first replicate paired with this one, this is the second replicate paired with this, third paired with this, and so forth. Okay? Where are the controls? The control is cells that are not infected with the virus. So this is the control for that experiment. So, okay, we've got um, cells, we're measuring uh, expression of about 8,000 genes. We've got two conditions, one infected with the HIV virus, one that's not infected. Yes? We've got four replicates here. Four over here and four over here. Okay? Two, two conditions, HIV infected, non-infected, and the four replicates. Biological replicates. Yes. Okay? That's a box plot. What do you think of, of this box plot? Oh, we're going to look at that. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, you, you sort of see the difference in this already. Yeah, I, hear, I realize you're all missing, you know, the pages in your notes, and I just don't know. Oh, I could have just skipped it. No one would have seen it. <laughs> okay. Um, so right away, I mean, here it's, what, what, what can you say about these uh, box plots here? There's a lot of outliers. Uh, where's the box? We don't even see the box, right? It's squished towards the zero over here. So it's highly skewed towards the high values. So, uh, um, <clears throat> okay, y axis, you mean over here? Oh, the y axis, that's the intensity. So. It's kind of like the expression of uh, all the genes coming from that array, from that array. It's a measure of the expression. It's the intensity, which is a measure of the expression. Each dot one, one gene, gene exactly. Each dot is one gene. So another way to look at it is to do a histogram like we've done before. What can you say about the histogram? It's highly skewed again, everything is squished towards zero, and then yeah, there's some high values that we can barely see over here, barely see over here. Basically, this is not really a, a nice way to look at the data. And if I were to ask you, do you think these data are from a normal distribution? What would you say? No, it doesn't look like it. It's highly skewed. Uh, it's very difficult to look at it. Yes. Uh, but before we do that, <clears throat> there's another thing that's uh, pretty interesting, and uh, you, maybe you will talk a little bit about that tomorrow uh, when you'll talk about regression. But one thing also that people tend to look at when you look at these kinds of data is trying to look at the mean versus the standard deviation. <coughs> 
Why would you do that? So for each gene, we've got four replicates, okay? Since we've got four replicates for each gene, I can compute the expression, uh, the average expression across the four replicates, and I can also compute the standard deviation of the expression across the four replicates. And this is what I show you here. I show you the mean expression versus the standard deviation of the expression. What you see here is that um, if you ju just ignore the red line for now, what you see the plus is that there's some kind of dependence. When you've got a high mean, you tend to have a higher standard deviation. Then you've got a low mean, you've got a lower standard deviation. For those who don't really know that, the lowest fit is what we call uh, a scatter smoother or a locally weighted scatter plot smoother. So it's something that will try to estimate the trend that you see in the plot. So it's kind of like doing a linear regression where you've got a straight line. But this is more flexible. It will tend to try to tell you what the trend is in the data. So this is a good way to do um, exploratory data analysis when you try to see the trend in the scatter plot. Okay, so it's kind of like, it's what we call a non-parametric uh, estimate. It's something that's not um, not exactly a straight line. It can be pretty flexible, and it will try to uh, estimate the 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 curve that we see in the data. Okay, so I'm not going to go too much in the details. This is just to try to highlight the fact that there's a dependency between the x and y axis. So typically genes that are more variable will have a higher mean. So let's try to do that in R. And then I'll tell you a little bit why we're trying to do that. So this is a very interesting function here that we haven't looked at before. <clears throat> this is called the apply function. So remember before we've talked about the for and the while loops, right? That is that we could compute the mean of a vector, um, compute the, the square of a vector by just squaring the vector, or we could loop, loop over all the elements in the vector and compute the square of, that vector, of uh, the element in the vector. Well, sometimes it's nice to be able to, if you have a data matrix, you would want to compute, let's say, the mean of each of the row of the data matrix, okay, or maybe of each of the columns of the data matrix. So the way you could do that is that you could loop, and you could say for each row, I'm going to compute the mean and store it into some kind of vector. But we've seen earlier that when you do that with the loops, it's very slow. Right? Especially with, uh, here it's, it's uh, an example where we've got about 8,000 genes. So if you look over the 8,000 genes and every time you compute the mean of the four replicates, it's going to be very slow. So R is vectorized. So every time you can try to do things more efficiently, you should try to do it. And there's a, a couple of functions you can do, you can um, use to do that. There's one that's called apply. Apply, the, the basic idea is that you will try to apply a function to each uh, row or column of a data matrix. And it's much faster than doing a loop. So here what I say is that, okay, here's my data matrix. These are the first four columns of the data, which are just the HIV samples. What I want to do is that I want to compute the mean for each row of the data matrix. If I put a two, it would mean column, so, okay? So if you want to know more, you can do question mark apply. So what this would do, one mean is that you're going to compute the mean for each row of the data matrix, and two would mean you're going to compute the mean for each column of the data matrix. Okay, so it's a way to apply a function to each row of a data matrix, and it's a lot more efficient than just doing a loop and computing the mean every time. And there are variants of apply that you can look at if you're more interested. <clears throat> okay, so let's, let's go into R. Actually, we probably need to load the HIV data first. And now we're going to compute that. So you can see that even though we're looping over the 8,000 genes, it's still pretty efficient, pretty fast, right? It's because R knows that you want to apply the same function, so you're saying, well, let's try to be smart and we're going to do it internally in a more efficient way. Okay, and then we can try to plot that. And you can see that dependency between the two. 
and we can try to estimate the trend. So for the lowest, we put x is the mean, y is sd, and we're going to try to estimate that trend, and then we're going to plot it. Okay, and here you can see it's almost linear. It's almost like there's a linear relationship between the two. It's not quite linear, but it's almost linear. And if it was not linear, it would draw some Yeah, exactly. So lowest is kind of, it's nice because it's more flexible. So if, if the relationship was very different from a line, it would sort of show that on the plot. Okay, and that's why it's kind of like doing linear regression, but since we, we don't really care about the actual line, all we care is about trying to look at the trend. Lowest is more flexible, but it's still pretty robust. It will give you a good answer uh, uh, in many cases. If there was no, no dependency of one... You will see something almost flat. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> We're going to look at that, actually. So that, that actually is better to look for dependency, right? No, because um, the thing is that if you do a statistical test, or if you do linear regression, for example, this is a different context, but often you can assume that the errors are independent. Here it's not really independent because you've got uh, a dependency of the, the error on the mean. So gene with, more, uh, with higher expression will tend to be more variable, yeah. right? So the, there's, it's not uh, independent and the, the variance is not constant. So there are some statistical tests that assume that the variance is constant. Like in linear regression, for example, we'll assume that the, 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 the variance is constant across the range of the data. OK, so here are some of the observations that we've made. So the data are highly skewed. When we looked at the box plot, the histograms, it was difficult to see anything. Uh, the standard deviation is not constant as it increases with the mean. So a solution for these kinds of data, when you do have that, when it's highly skewed and you've got um, very large observation that are outlier is to look for a transformation that will try to make the data more symmetric and the variance more constant. Typically these two things go together is that if you make the data more symmetric with less outliers and so forth you will also tr tend to make the variance more constant. So with positive data typically you will look for the log transformation. So there's a couple of transformations that are important. There's the log, there's the square root, um, and there's other kinds of, of uh, power transformation. But for gene expression data, the log transformation is typically very accurate. So, okay, so let's try to take the log of our data and to see what it looks like. So what about if it's neg negative data? What type of transformation can it normalize? That's, that's a good point. So there are a couple of things you can do. <coughs> so there are variants of the log transformation that will uh, uh, try to take into account that you've got negative values. So for example, you could um, you could define something like that. You could do a log of your data plus some kind of constant, like you know, something that makes it positive. Uh, there are variants of, of the log transform that will handle the, the, the case where x is negative or very small. But the idea is basically the same. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So here we take the log and we do a box plot. Okay, so it looks much better already, right? It looks more symmetric. It's more comparable across. We really see what's going on. There are still quite a few outliers, but it looks, you know, fairly symmetric. If we look at the histogram, well, this is much nicer, right? I mean, it looks a lot more like a bell curve, like a normal distribution, right? So when I look at these kinds of data, I'm, I like it better because it's easier to see things. And it's what we expect. It's more comparable across. It makes more sense. Now I'm going to do the same thing again. So we've taken the log of our expression. <clears throat> and we're going to apply the mean and the standard deviation to each row of the data matrix and do the same plot, mean versus standard deviation again. And this is what we get. This is the mean, this is the standard deviation, and this is the lowest fit. And you can see that it's not exactly flat, but it's almost flat, which shows you that there's almost no more dependence between the mean and the standard deviation. So taking the log, I sort of almost removed that dependence between the two. Okay, does that make sense? So. Higher, 
Yes, exactly. So here it's almost the inverse. So maybe it sort of suggests that perhaps the transformation was a bit too strong. Maybe something you know less than the log, uh, like the square root, maybe would have been more appropriate to uh, properly uh, remove that dependence. But there are variants of transformation to completely remove the uh, the dependence between the two. But here the key point was to show that a transformation as simple as the log will often do the trick for positive uh, data that are highly skewed. So with gene expression data, almost all of the time you will just take the log. Question, so yes? Do you need then to transform the data before you do anything with the log? Yes. Yes. And always looking for that independent of standard deviation? Yes. Or, you know, as, least, as, as much as you can, try to remove that dependence, make the data more symmetric on the histogram and box plots. So typically, you will try to do that right away. You read in your raw data, you try to make it more symmetric, you know, uh, slightly better, and you take that transformation, and then everything else after is going to be based on the transform data. So this is sort of a, a quick summary. So of course, it's, you know, uh, you should take that with a grain of salt because there's really lots of variants and transformations and methods you can do, but it's just to say that typically the log will do the trick on expression data. And in fact, with most of, of, uh, of uh, g positive genomic data, you know, if you've got uh, expression data, if you've got counts coming from high throughput sequencing, the log will also do the trick. So there's a lot of things where the log is just a very good transformation. <clears throat> so there's a couple more reasons. So we've said, you know, it makes data more symmetric. Uh, the large observation are not as influential. <coughs> the variance is more constant. But also what's nice about the log is that it turns multiplication into addition. Okay, and in fact, this is really nice because it's a lot easier to do addition than multiplications, right? So for example, if you look at expression data and you compare two samples, uh, people often like to look at the fold change. You know, what's the difference in fold change between the two samples? Well, if you take the log, computing a fold change will just be computing the difference between two logs. And that's a lot easier. So in practice, people um, kind of like to use the log base 2, um, which is just the log of x divided by the log of 2. So in terms of the statistics, it doesn't make any difference. OK, so let's look at scatter plots now. So this is still the same um, data. They are, these data are log transformed now, because we know this is the right thing to do. And we do just a scatter plot. We plot the first column of the data set, which is um, the first replicate coming from the HIV sample versus the first replicate coming from the control sample. Okay, so these are the two measurements that are coming from the same chip, the same microarray, one from the chip man, one from the control. So HIV one, control one. What can you see on this plot? Well, we also use the rest of the population. Yeah. What are these genes, you think? Yeah. So these are the HIV control, the HIV control genes, right? The one that should be extremely differentially expressed. Um, otherwise, of course, there's some other stuff going on on either side of the plot. But most of them seem to be aligned on the y uh, equal x line, right? Which says that overall, there's not much differential expression except for a few genes, which is typical for a micro experiment. Most of the genes will be changed, and some of them will be uh, differentially expressed. Now, we, you know, we might ask, well, is this really the best way to look at the data when we look at a scatter plot? Because what we really care about is the difference between the two uh, samples, the difference between the treatment and the control. So another way to look at gene expression data is to do what we call an AMA plot. So the AMA plot is very similar to scatter plot, but except that instead of showing the, the one sample versus the other sample, we're going to show m, which is the minus between the log ratio, and the average between the log ratio. 
So this is just uh, the average of the two samples is, an, is a measure of the overall intensity and the minus of the two sample on the log scale is just a log ratio. So it's just the log of the fall change, if you want. So these are the two quantities. Well, this is really the quantity you're interested in, which is the difference between the two sample. And this is a measure of, if you want, the quality of your measurement because you, the, the greater the intensity, the more you trust the measurement. When you've got very low intensity, it tends to be slightly more noisy because at low end, it's high to have uh, to make sure that the gene was above the detection level, for example, so it's slightly more variable. So typically, people really like these kinds of plots because it shows you the genes that are differentially expressed. You can draw a line, y equals zero, everything that's way above, way below will be the differentially expressed genes. Things that are uh, around the axis, y equals zero, are the ones that are not differentially expressed. And the one that sometimes are sort of towards the low end, I mean, be the one that are low quality, you want to ignore. So, so the average is across, across each line, right? Across each so, the average of each gene? Okay, so here, here we, we look at the 8,000 genes. Yeah. Okay. What we have is that we've got uh, two measurements, one coming from the HIV sample, yeah. one coming from the control. So M is... The minus between the log of treatment minus log of, minus log of control. This is the average of, of uh, this is just log of control plus log of treatment divided by two. Okay, so this is a measure of the overall intensity, the overall expression of the gene in the two samples. This is just the the, the, the difference between the two expression how on the log scale. How much the difference even, uh, diverges from the, the, the average of across all the samples? That's what it mm. How much it diverges from the average? The uh, it, how much is it different from uh, between the two samples for that gene? So let's look at this point, for example. This is one of the HIV genes. So here it's eight. It tells you that the difference between the control and the treatment on the log scale is eight, which means that it's highly expressed in the HIV sample. And uh, the overall intensity is about six, which tells you that the, the average of the two expression is about uh, six. So it's, it's a difference that is, that is trustable. Exactly. So it's high enough that you say, well, I trust that. Because, for example, if you look at this one, you might say, yeah. oh, this is differentially expressed. But when you look at where it stands towards the low expression, yeah. you know it's, it's noisy. Well, the truth is that these, these work for fairly old experiments using cDNA microarrays. I think they are from 2000 or something. So the quality is slightly better now. Um, soon people might not even do microarrays anyway. But at least it shows you that there are better ways to look at the data than just uh, straight scatter plot for gene expression data. Okay, so this is one way uh, or one example of way it makes sense to try to look at the data in the best way possible to show the sort of things you're interested in in the plot. Okay. Um, any questions about this? Do you guys want to do that in R or do you want to keep going? You've got all the code, so it's up to you if you want to try it or you want to just keep going. Okay. And, you know, if you've got questions in. Six more hours. I thought. Um, yeah, and if you've got questions, you can you can always ask me later. Okay, so here I'm doing the exact same thing for the four replicates. So we've got four replicates. I'm doing the MA plot, which is what I show here, and <clears throat> I'm doing a low S in addition to the MA plot, just to show the the overall trend. Okay, so what can you say about these four plots? Fairly consistent. Fairly consistent. We've got the differentially expressed genes over here, right? So, you know, it's it's nice, it's reproducible, it shows that you always pick out the genes that are differentially expressed. Um, what about the trend? Can you say something about that? What, what dice would the range control? 
Uh, two and two. So one and two being uh, uh, then you swap the three and four basically. So you make one and two from one line, three and four from another line. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we can see that here there is what we call a die effect because if you look at the trend of the lowest plot, so here the the treatment was done, let's say, with the green die, I can't remember, and the control with the red. And then you swap that here, you did treatment with red and control with gray. So what you can see is that one of the dye is, tends to be slightly brighter than the other, higher signal. So here it's the one at the bottom, and here there's the one above. So by swapping the two, that allows you, that there is, uh, that allows you to see that there is some kind of a dye effect. If you didn't do a dye swap, you couldn't really say that. I mean, maybe you would see a trend like that if you didn't do a dye swap. But we wouldn't know if it's really due because of the dyes or if it's just a biological effect or something else, right? So doing the dye swap, you can actually observe that there's a difference between the two uh, due to the dye effect, okay? So this is one thing that typically people would try to do with normalization. You've got, so think about the lowest fit as some kind of a string and the pattern shows you the dye effect, right? Because if you assume that most of the genes should not be differentially expressed, then it should be pretty much a straight line around y equals zero. But here we don't really observe that. We see some kind of a trend. So this is what we call lowest normalization. Lowest normalization will say, this should be a straight line. So I'm going to push it. I'm going to push all the genes with it to make it a straight line. And then I'm going to say, I, I have normalized my data. Okay. So very simple idea. Lowest normalization says, it should be a straight line because most of the genes should not be differentially expressed. There should be no dye effect, so there's no reason to see a trend. If there is one, I'm going to correct for it. So the, the lowest normalization applies to each, to each, uh, each uh, sample individual, uh, each replicate individual. And here, replicate one to is pairs. HIV one we control one, HIV two we control two. Exactly. No, that's different. RMA is more for uh, affymetrix type data, but um, RMA alone is typically no, not enough. Okay, RMA is not, I mean, it can do normalization, but it's not really a normalization technique. The idea between RMA, uh, behind RMA is to summarize the prop set into an expression level, but uh, before you do that, you should probably normalize your data either using quantile normalization or lowest normalization. And often it will be done using quantile normalization. So RMA contains normalization as part of it, but the, the main idea be, behind RMA is not really normalization. So but on top of this type of normalization, then you have to put normalization that normalizes across all the, the, the arrays, right? N not for the, um, what, n not really, because I mean you're right at the end. What you want is a single number that represents everything across the replicates, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what we're going to do when we do testing, when we're going to test a hypothesis that test that a gene is differentially expressed on. <clears throat> so here, you know, I know you were going to ask this question, so I just put that here. How do we find differentially expressed genes? Okay, that's going to be the next question. Okay, so we've seen a little bit of exploratory data analysis. Um, of course, there's a lot of you know there's a lot more things you can do. I think EDA is really a, a, a subset of statistics that is very easy to understand because it's yes, it is statistics. We're computing some summary statistics. We're doing some graphics, box plots, histograms, but there's no real uh, theory behind it, right? It's very easy to understand that. So if you if you want to know more about exploratory data analysis, you can pick out some books. You can go and play with R. There's a lot of tools, a lot of functions and graphics you can use. Um, and in my opinion, it's extremely, extremely important. Because a lot of people will sort of rush and do a statistical analysis and do, this is the p-value, this is what we've done. We've done this fancy statistical analysis. But they have no idea if it's valid. And most of the time, I can assure you that, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if 80% of the papers that get published don't even look for these kinds of assumptions and they just do it and they just need a p-value to get it published and then they don't care. But it's not very difficult to do. Is yeah. it uh, common practice to, in, in a good sort of uh, biostats paper to actually present that data and something 
Yes. So actually, I mean, it's a good question. So often when you, it's, it's actually really annoying, but when you uh, try to publish a paper in a biostat journal or something, people will, it's not uncommon that people say, you know, are the assumptions correct? Can you show us some plots and things that it shows? So we had to do that for a paper uh, very recently, which I thought was kind of a waste of time on my end because we did check all the all, all of the assumptions and everything but we had to regenerate a bunch of plots and things to make sure that it was correct and it was valid to do these kinds of analysis and these data I was uh, working on some cheap cheap data um, but at least we had to do it and there's a lot of papers where they wouldn't they, they, where they would not do it so there's actually a famous well I wouldn't say really famous but he's there's a, a biostatistician at uh, Texas A&M who's called uh, Keith Bagley and I think his job is just to look at papers that people have published, try to replicate what they've done and show that it's impossible and it's just all bogus. So he gives like very, very interesting talks where he just goes and rumble about a bunch of, of stuff that people have done before that it's not reproducible. So there was um, uh, about a year ago he gave that talk where uh, they were talking about um, I think he was trying to find a gene signature in, in, in cancer and things like that. And the people found a set of genes that were, uh, that could be used to discriminate between cancer subtypes and they tried to reproduce everything and what they realized that it was impossible to reproduce it. But then if you just, uh, and there is two indices, so if you, if you were to start the, your gene numbering at one or zero, the answer will be different is because when you read into Excel, it starts at one instead of zero, vice versa. And so basically everything was screwed up because one of the index was, was different in the analysis and everything was completely wrong in the paper. Uh, and I actually wrote a letter to the editor to say that it was wrong, but it never went anywhere. Um, but this is just to say that if you were just to do very easy exploratory data analysis, not only to check that the assumptions are correct, but to check also that the results that you got at the end make sense, you would avoid these kinds of stupid mistakes because you would see it very clearly that, that what you got do not really match what you have in your data. Um, so that would save you a lot of time and probably a lot of uh, embarrassment in the future. And I think R provides a great framework for EDA. It doesn't take very long. You can load up your data. You can do a couple of plots. And in fact, once you have an experiment or some data set that you use all the time, you can have a little script that will do this uh, quality assessment for you. And this is some of the things we've done. So we've worked a little bit with Robert Gentleman on the analysis of flow cytometry data. And we've done a lot of uh, uh, quality assessment of uh, flow, cytometry, flow cytometry data using histograms and box plots and uh, um, empirical cumulative distribution and what it does, nothing fancy, it just generates a lot of panels and you can look at the plots and you can quickly identify if there's something that went wrong. 